Oh my god, what am I doing? Hi, welcome to Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree. You are watching the final video in a series on the Gulag Archipelago written by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The Gulag Archipelago It's a book that's based on documentary evidence from his own experience and the experiences of others that covers what happened in the labor camps that existed in Russia from 1918 to 1956 under Joseph Stalin's rule. This was what occurred after a communist revolution, which as you may know, the economic theory from Karl Marx and Frederick Engels is that after capitalism, where the capitalists own the means of production, then you have socialism naturally occurring, some natural progression, and then you have communism, which is also a natural progression where everybody, including the workers, own the means of production instead of it being managed by a separate group of people who start the businesses, etc. Instead of waiting for that natural evolution to occur, they had a revolution and they got rid of all the other socialists a particular group of socialists and then they established labor camps because quote unquote he who does not work must not eat but i'm getting into detail about this but i'm doing that because i don't know if you watching this or listening will have listened to the entire series since it's so long and this is meant to shorten it for anyone who is interested in looking into this so this video covers the end of volume three the last volume out of three volumes in the book and part six chapters one to seven and part seven last part chapters one to three so volume three of the gulag archipelago part six exile chapter one exile in the first years of freedom this chapter is about how the meaning of the word exile changed under the Soviet Union. Exile was a practice that was common in human society and in Russian society before the 1800s, starting in 1648 and it was used under the Tsars to exile prisoners and in the past it meant being banished but you could still have provisions sent from the state. The classic example, very relevant to this story, is Lenin still being able to have a monthly stipend and afford housing and do his research on the theory of revolution while he was receiving a monthly stipend. He even had leftover money to plan his escape. And even before then, in the time of Pushkin, exiles would complain about idleness and being bored and they would beg to be sent back to the homeland. In 1645, the number of exiles in Siberia was 1,500. But a regulation by Alexander on exiles in 1822 gave legal status to the word exile and it was used to describe katorga rather than just settlement elsewhere. By the end of the 19th century, there were 300,000 people in exile at any time. And this is according to a geographical study by Semyonov Tyanshansky. Excuse me for name stuff. Regular exiles who were sent to settlement, sometimes the locals would despise them, but if you were a political ex exile, then you were probably welcomed and able to publish in newspapers and become experts in topics because you had so much time on your hands. With money from the state, the stipend, you could buy a house, have children, send them to school, and this wasn't only for prominent individuals. This is in the past. Solzhenitsyn speaks about a man who was called Menshikov and he was exiled to a place called Veryovzov in 1727. He built a church, talked to the locals about the vanity of the world, grew a beard and died after two years. Solzhenitsyn also questions why did certain prominent individuals in Russian history such as Radishev and Pushkin, what did they find so intolerable about being in exile that they would commit suicide or write to the state asking to be begged to go back? Stolypin wanted to abolish exiles by 1906, but it was too convenient for the Soviet Union and they didn't just use it for regular prisoners but for politicals. First, they did it to slowly pick off anyone who wasn't from the Bolshevik party, even if they were socialists like I keep mentioning, and then later they would properly dispose of them and the stipends dwindled from what they used to be in the past to only double the cost of a loaf of bread and you used to be able to buy a house with the monthly stipend. I'm not sure if that means monthly stipend builds up over time or literally the monthly stipend adult. It must mean literally over time. Stalin also promised land to the Zionist Socialist Party of Jews who wanted to establish Jewish agrarian communes in Crimea 
only to later jail them. And former socialists eventually became silent because talking about someone exiled meant that the person who was speaking would also get exiled. And exiles were used to pick up people who were free-spirited, not just political, even if they weren't of a particular political party. Chapter 2. The Peasant Plague This chapter is about the high number of peasants who were killed through the First and Second World Wars. They're forgotten, these lives and souls, and the title of this chapter refers to how many people were killed off just to fit into the plan of the state. So the kinds of people who were called petite bourgeoisie were people who were businessmen, office workers, peasants, actors, airmen, students, and doctors. Labels were used to make it clear who was bad, just like what happens in today's society, and to simplify the need for people to think for themselves. So the cleansing of the Kulak class commenced up to the taking away of all property and to the liquidation of the class itself. However, after all was said and done, they still had to do more cleansing of people over time. Didn't they get rid of everyone already the first time? I guess not. One place that's an example of where people were sent to settle is Urupinskaya and that would accommodate troops or later resettle exiles. At some point, I started calling Solzhenitsyn Solji, so I'm gonna just say that because I've been reading his work for a while and I think he wouldn't mind. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that. Solji lists stories of the kind of people who are called bloodsuckers by the state. One man and his family, they worked on ruling land. They cultivated it, transformed it, and then he was later called a bloodsucker even though he actually became part of collective work groups. And there's a case of a village's men being picked off in order to then go back and pick off the woman because no one was there to defend them. In one case, the tax collectors taxed someone who couldn't pay the taxes down to the family's clothes and animals and the plants. I think they mean the factories. He means the factories for the business. So the man ended up destroying the property to avoid giving it to the state, and then the state deported him. There are stories of people who are carted off to the middle of nowhere, and there are modern pleasure boats, at least at the time of writing the book, beyond the Kimki, where workers were sent to the Volga Canal to work, and that's the same place where the bones were buried, which I mentioned in an earlier video. In one case, a woman gave birth to a child during transport on the train and there wasn't any food and she didn't have any milk and the ration per day was one glass of water and some bread. And so the child died on the train and soldiers ended up throwing the child overboard and what parents would do was in secret release their children thinking that it would be easier for them to beg on the streets. There's a place called Archangel where people were sent and spotted fever developed because there was no way to wash and the people's bodies had sores and peasants just died walking in the streets. And people would be seized and have their passports taken if they tried to help anyone. Even dead people couldn't be picked up and the militia, get this, would be on the lookout for acts of kindness. Here's an enlightening quote. The plight of these peasants differed from that of all previous and subsequent Soviet exiles in that they were banished not to a center of population, a place made habitable, but to the haunt of wild beasts, into the wilderness, to man's primitive condition. No, worse, even in their primeval state, or forebears at least, chose places near water for their settlements. For as long as mankind has existed, no one has ever made his home elsewhere. So settlers would be put four kilometers away from a water source on purpose, and they were sometimes explicitly forbidden to grow any crops, and they also had their animals removed, and animals were everything to a peasant. I like how at this point in the book, Soji says that men who had woken up on their own all their lives to work were now being forced to work fields every morning. And only the man with a rifle, the ones in charge, could say yay or nay to anything. Essentially, exiled persons in special settlements were basically treated like Zex. On July 3, 1939, the USSR made an announcement that former Kulaks could have their civil rights restored after five years only if they had done socially useful work and shown loyalty to the regime by helping officers with their tasks. 
some settlers actually did well off because they were left to their own devices and over time wealth would build up because they worked the land and formed their own communities and were self-sufficient but then out of nowhere someone from the regime would catch them and they couldn't understand where all the wealth had come from out of nowhere because human ingenuity just comes out of nowhere <laughs> And they also couldn't understand, especially because that kind of abundance wasn't present under the socialist Soviet regime. Solzhenitsyn talks about a group of old believers who were found in 1950 from a plane flying over somewhere called the Podkamenaya Tunguska. This place hadn't been seen in 20 years, but they worked out the position and it was reported. And then half a year later, they struggled through the wilderness to find a group of Yaruyevo old believers. These people had fled to this place when the Great Plague, aka the collectivization, aka the removal of all the peasants had happened. And they had lived there and they had homespun their own clothes and had really sturdy boots. And they were labeled as anti-Soviet agitators for living in the wilderness for years. And they were then basically stripped of all their rights of citizens in special settlements, as well as anyone who married them or visited them who was a relative. Chapter 3. The ranks of exile thicken. Only peasants were so ruthlessly exiled as described in the previous chapter. People could be exiled for belonging to a criminal nationality, a previous term of imprisonment in camps, Residents in a criminal environment, such as seditious Leningrad, places with partisan movements like Western Ukraine or the Baltic states. Families were separated. For example, a husband was exiled as a Zionist and sent to the Krasnoyarsk, while his family was sent to Salekard. I probably pronounced that wrong. Only after the 1920s was exile not just temporary and existing exile areas were convenient for the expansion of the Gulag Archipelago, especially to ship off women and children en masse and the end of general exile came only in 1955. Exile conditions were often as harsh as conditions in camp because at least in camp there were rations. Exiles were tied to the places they were sent to and often had deductions from their wages until they ended up being in debt to the state. One exile, he passed a medical exam to get a job in regular life and he had served jail time and so he couldn't get that work even though he had also served at the front in the war beforehand. The more in the wilderness an exile was sent, the more their rights weren't there because no one could check up on them. There is an example of a man who was assigned to be a literal slave to a chairman's four wives in the Turgai Wild. This was a Kolkots chairman. So where there might be a documented case of an exile attempting to escape, it could be that they were actually trying to get out in order to make a complaint because if they stayed where they were, their complaint would just go to the officials and the officials couldn't pass on a complaint except through the discretion of the local MVD, the special forces. Towns also had resentencing operations that were ongoing to help find exiles through informers and uh, exile would often thus end up with a second prison term. But it's difficult to get the full picture of what happened in exile because they wouldn't have photographs and documentation the way that would happen in camps. Here's a funny quote. Exile in Orde has left behind none of those rather jolly group photographs. You know the sort. Third from the left, Ulyanov. Second on the right, Kurzyzhanovsky. All well fed, all neatly dressed, knowing neither toil nor want, every last beard tidily trimmed, every single cap of good fur. Those, my children, were very dark times. Chapter 4 Nations in Exile. This chapter is exactly what it sounds like. It's about the removal of entire groups of people based on ethnicity. Rather than dealing with the details of sentencing individuals, First, in 1937, with tens of thousands of Koreans, seemingly as a practice run, they were sent without public outrage to Kazakhstan and entire nations were condemned and exiled. Then, in 1940, the Karelia Finnish Republic, Leningrad Finns and Estonians, they were sent to Karelia. 
but unusually about 26 of them they were brave enough to not give up their passports and that helped a lot in 1941 the volga germans were extracted and it became easy to identify who was a traitor in the nation based on their last name if their last name sounded german and there weren't any individual show trials the only stumbling block to this was mixed marriages and mixed nationalities. Solji makes the comparison that this exile was only like that of the Atlantic slave trade since most conquering and colonialism left local inhabitants intact where they were and it still wasn't exactly the same since the slave trade involved individuals making trades rather than the state. I also note that he points out Christians being complicit and greedy in the Atlantic slave trade. The time that it took for people to have to gather up all their belongings after living there for generations shortened from a few hours to like 30 minutes. One family was lucky enough to be told by the officers ransacking their house and getting them to leave to carry something that they could use for work like their sewing machine which actually ended up being useful in making money later on. It's mentioned that the Altai mines were worse than the Katorga. But special settlers in the Kolkots, they had it the worst, and it's debatable whether or not that was worse than the camps. Solzhenitsyn says that it was so similar to the point of it being boring to write about it, the Kolkots and special settlers compared to the camps. Different groups responded differently to being settled in the wilderness. Germans were known for building things that lasted and also for having strong morals, Brides were very often wanted from German populations, and the Greeks were known for certain foods. The Koreans, they weren't known for building things until the younger generations were Europeanized, but they were known from early on to settle into the educational institutions. And then other nations didn't think to build anything for long at all, for permanency, and the Chechens were the most resistant. They didn't let their women work, they wouldn't send their children to school, and they would build things to last only for a day or a week or a month. They were also known for robbing others, and they only respected rebels. The Chechens were very outstanding in the Kengir uprising, and everybody was afraid of them. There's a story of a Chechen boy that's used to explain their culture and why everybody was afraid of them. One Chechen man did some egregious assault against another Chechen person, but the man who did it, he ran away, and so someone from his clan, his kin, instead had to be, his life had to be taken. And so they were actually the elders of the Chechen group. They were looking at a young boy. The young boy's family had to hide him for days because they knew that he would be killed as the way their law worked. In the end, that ended up not happening, but it shows someone else got killed instead. But it just shows how serious they were about their laws and why everybody was afraid of them. And then after that young boy's life got saved, their culture was, uh, no comments on them currently, I don't know anything except from the book, um, was uh, strict and just and harsh. And to the point where their laws were almost more upheld <laughs> and had integrity compared to the camp. Chapter 5. End of sentence. This chapter is about what it was actually like for prisoners once they were supposedly released and had completed their sentences. And it also describes in detail Solzhenitsyn's experience after his release. Prisoners would dream about exile, although no one had ever told them anything good about it. They would anxiously await letters or some kind of correspondence to know what it was like. Exile was given to the first completed tenors, those 10 year sentences, even when exile wasn't a part of the sentence. And nobody, not the officials, nor the prisoners were surprised by this because they had just become used to this treatment where nobody cares and there was just corruption all throughout the law and the system and how it worked. It also, on the plus side, forewent their responsibility of figuring out where they needed to stay. Especially when they wouldn't have anyone there to look out for them or anyone waiting for them when they got out into freedom. This quote made me laugh. Nonetheless, as we left the camp under guard, we were still careful to respect the final prison superstitions. On no account must you look back at your last prison or else you will return. And you must do the right thing with your spoon. What was the right thing though? 
Some said, take it with you or you would return for it. Others said, fling it at the prison or else the prison would pursue you. I had molded my spoon myself in the foundry and I took it with me. Although a prisoner's sentence might be over, they would be transported between MVD posts and made to sit on the floor and follow orders and have dogs bark at them just like they were still prisoners. So Janison, in his experience with this, he ran into an engineer called Vladimir Alexandrovich. This engineer was ahead of his time and his works had been used in the Soviet Union, although they weren't being properly accredited to him because they were saying that he was dead, even though he wasn't. He was languishing in a soviet cell somewhere so Janitsyn, after his release he ended up in what's called the oblast which is like an administrative area for a region he wanted to stay there in the oblast but he ended up going to the kokterek desert district that was north of the oblast so Janitsy mentions again talking about the engineer that russia is he used the word is a land of smothered opportunities and that the engineer, based on what the officials were doing, actually got exiled to the wrong place. You know, incompetence. Wasted opportunity. So Janison ends up at the MBD, MGB, the Special Forces building. He's excited at becoming a teacher, possibly because he sees one, and he wants to teach and then makes a comparison between the different estates when he sees this teacher and he's not and he feels like he can't ever get to this point because he's now a former Zek. So he asks for this job but they question him and they make him wait for a month in order to tell him that they don't have any space although that's an absolute lie because he gets the intel from another former prisoner and there was actually a shortage of maths and physics teachers which is what he wanted to teach. Here's a wonderful quote about being in freedom. A night under the open sky we had forgotten what it was like. There had always been locks and bars, always walls and ceilings. I had no thought of sleep. I walked and walked and walked about the prison service yard, which was bathed in soft, warm light. A cart left where it had been unhitched, a well, a drinking trough, a small hayrick, the black shadows of horses under an open-sided shed. It was all so peaceful, so ancient, so free from the cruel imprint of the MVD. It was only the 3rd of March, but there was not the slightest chill in the night air. It was still almost summery, as it had been in the daytime. Again and again, the brain of donkeys rose over the sprawling town of Kokterek, long, drawn out, and passionate, telling the she asses of their love, of the ungovernable strength flooding their bodies. Some of the brain was probably the she asses answering. I found it difficult to distinguish one voice from another, but that powerful bass bellowing was perhaps the noise of camels. I felt that if I only had a voice, I, too, would start baying at the moon. I shall be able to breathe here. I shall be able to move around. Surely, I should break through that paper curtain of forms. With that trumpeting night around me, I felt superior to all those timorous bureaucrats. To teach! To feel myself a man again to sweep into the classroom and run my burning eyes over childish faces. My finger points to a drawing. They all hold their breath. Given. To prove. Construction. Proof. They all breathe freely again. I cannot sleep. I walk and walk and walk in the moonlight. The donkeys sing their song. The camels sing. Every fiber in me sings. I am free. I am free. In the end, I lie down beside my comrades on some hay under the open-sided shelter. Two steps away from us, horses stand at their mangers peacefully champing hay all night long. Surely there could be no sweeter, no more friendly sound on this or first night of freedom. Champ away, you mild, inoffensive creatures. I just note that the writing becomes very humorous from here on out. It just, the text feels different and there's a lot of more humor which was always there, but it's like just more through the writing. It's a little bit more lighthearted and it really conveys the feeling of freedom, even though he's still talking about all the things wrong. So Janisian ends up finding a small hut with a low roof to live in and he pretends to be mournful with the rest of the townspeople when news comes on the radio on March 5, 1953, that Stalin has died. Chapter 6. The Good Life in Exile. 
Suddenly, Solzhenitsyn ends up being called to the Kokterek district's consumer cooperative, the acronym for that is the RIPO, without the need for interviews and filling out paperwork because there was a price recalculation of goods needed to be done on short notice. This was a regular occurrence. This was for mandated price reductions because that's how pricing works. My comments, sarcasm. He was appointed to be a planning officer with a salary of 450 rubles per month. Solzhi was annoyed and dissatisfied at having to work. And he comments on how quickly his wants and desires changed because before he just wanted to be free and not have to dig in frozen soil or mix brick without having shoes in ice cold weather. But now he gets to sit at a clean desk and turn the handle of a calculating machine, which he had to ask for and he's annoyed. There were orders based on quote unquote signs that eight hours of sleep weren't necessary, but Solzhenitsyn is brave enough to ignore those orders and comes into work at 9 a.m. and leaves at 5 p.m. He's also eventually called to be a school teacher and this makes him incredibly happy. He talks about how education changed in Russia and how the exiled students, they were so eager to learn and they would show up particularly for extra classes. There was also corruption with officials where officials' children were to be given high marks and teachers might have to pay for the birthday of an official's child, which doesn't make any sense. So Janisian was needed as a math teacher and he marked honestly because he believed that this kept students eager to learn. Feedback is important, which is why also in current times, if we're wondering about children or young students not doing well in school, this is my comment. It's not helpful to lie or inflate grades or anything for anybody, whoever they may be, anywhere. That's not how people learn. So Janisian also surprisingly becomes friends with a former secretary of the district party committee who had actually abandoned a regiment to death, but then ended up praying to God. And he says, open quote, I have no intention of forgiving everyone only those who have fallen. For where Solzhenitsyn was in Kokterek, as well as places like Southern Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzia, it wasn't as bad as other places described earlier for exiles because there was infrastructure there. And then there were other places as well, like Chimkent and Talas and Zambul and Alma-Ata or Franz where there wasn't really a difference between the rights that the or lack thereof for the townspeople and what the exiles and settlers experienced. It could also be easier for exiles to find work in these places because the townspeople avoided certain industrial and intellectual work. There was an amnesty from Voroshilov on March 27, 1953 for people with up to five year sentences one woman whose husband had been exiled for less than five years she had registered herself as an exile but then when the amnesty came although her husband could be released she couldn't be released because she had registered herself as an exile and she had to remain but after the fall of beria the mvd or special forces chief months later life changed drastically for exiles and things became relaxed but Solzhenitsyn was still cynical and he had a medical issue that couldn't be diagnosed and he also didn't think that he could find a wife that he could trust with his life experiences and his literature. He also felt hurried to write down what he was working on about life in camps and in exile. So he left for Tashkent the last night of 1953 for two more years of exile. I think, I'm not sure. He bought a home and focused on writing. Solji, again, for like the third time, he bemoans Pushkin's disdain of exile and thought that exile was a blessing in the course of Pushkin's life. When life starts easing up after an Adenur amnesty of September 1955, Solzhenitsyn writes for a review of his case and then he eventually reluctantly leaves. Sentences of exile are lifted for all 58, the politicals, this was only after they were lifted for Germans and supporters of Germans. Chapter 7. Zex at Liberty. Release was practically the same as imprisonment. And this is what this chapter is all about because it was the same careless strokes of pens by officials and the complete uprootment and disruption of an individual's life. So Janisin states that the space between two arrests, that is what release meant 
throughout the 40 pre-Khrushchev years. Life was difficult after release in terms of finding work, being helped by free people, even former friends. One man found out that he had been exed out of school old photo albums and some people tried to stay in camp or they would hang around because they might have to go back to prison again or they would be closer to people who would actually give them work. And some people at the time of writing the book were still found at the Nairob and Nairim districts. And on the Kalima, prisoners signed voluntary forms to continue working for Dalstroy. I don't think I say this later, so I'll just say it now. This reminds me of former slaves. Um, I mean, I don't know if how common this is because slavery has been everywhere, but they will stay with masters even after release. This is no comment on the conditions of, like if the masters were kind because of the society and how the society worked, or if they were completely unkind, but they decided to stay anywhere. Anyway, no comment on that, just that it reminds me of people would stay on afterwards uh, with masters. I'm nervously scratching because I just, I don't like talking about this stuff because it's always so complicated. I don't want anyone to assume that I'm saying or thinking something that I'm not saying or thinking, or else I would say it if that's what I was trying to say. So that's not what I'm trying to say, but I just wanted to part that out. Prison work didn't count for employment. One man lost his hearing assembling trains, but that didn't come towards employment because he didn't have the necessary certificates because the government loves to create these licenses and people who were rehabilitated, they were still treated negatively by superiors who had power over them. This made me laugh pretty hard. Even the young Verbovsky complains, look upon the rehabilitated with suspicion and contempt. Not all of them though. The majority of young people could not care less whether we have been rehabilitated or not, whether 12 million people are still inside or are inside no longer. They do not see that it affects them, just so long as they themselves are at liberty with their tape recorders and their disheveled girlfriends. I thought that was really funny. Sickness took some people who had been okay in the camps and some people didn't realize how much they would miss camps only when they were actually leaving. Some people rejected society altogether because they found a love for nature since they could not enjoy it. Some people avoided owning property or having careers. Some people made up for what they thought they had missed like making money or receiving some title or having children or chasing women or buying clothes or making money, I said that already. Some things like the clothes, it was to forget how they had been cut off from it and how it was taken away from them. Another thing was getting meals. And then some people tried to forget it all, including former communists who then retook party positions. Some people were traumatized in their sleep. Solzhenitsyn himself says that he was a prisoner in his dreams for like five years. And some people were traumatized walking through the forest. They might be afraid of German shepherd dogs, for example. Solzhenitsyn gave a lecture at the All Union Society for the Dissemination of Ignorance. That's a weird title. Isn't that just the school or like life itself? Where <laughs> women laborers at the camp, they were forced to come and listen. And only the trustees actually look like women. And Solzhenitsyn, while he's giving this lecture, he's afraid that they're going to take away his past because it's just a memory of being inside prison walls. So Janison also mentions that each year on the anniversary of his arrest, he organizes for himself a sex day where in the morning he cuts 650 grams, which is about 1.4 pounds of bread and puts two lumps of sugar in a cup and pours hot water in them. And then for lunch, he asks them, I'm not sure who he means by them, to make some broth and a little full of thin mush. And he says that it, puts him back in that place where he starts licking his bowl and picking up crumbs. He also brought with him his number patches and mentions that in some homes they're like holy relics and he wonders if he's the only one. At one point Solzhenitsyn says that he was walking down somewhere called Novoslobodskaya Street, the Baturki prison, the parcels reception room, and for the first time where he had been in prison, he sees where the parcels actually came from. So Janice mentions that if he gets a genuinely optimistic letter that isn't full of self-pity, he can know that it comes from a former Zek because they were tough and able to think of positive memories from their time 
Many people after leaving prison have spiritual realizations. One man writes verses like these. My life is set in this far place and lived in silence by God's will. For I have seen Cain face to face and could not bring myself to kill. This person later, Solji mentions as a side note, is unhappily married and loses touch with this spiritual side of himself. Something that would happen is that families and husbands and wives, they would meet each other again but not know each other. And a released prisoner might run into former wardens or informers and so on. In contrast to peasants who could be imprisoned for carrying out an execution by the Tsarist, 40 years after they'd done that, informers had statutes of limitations for them, so they could go around as if they hadn't done anything. Part 7. Stalin is no more. This opens with a quote from Revelation 9 verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders. Some passages in part 7 are left out for the English translation at Solzhenitsyn's request because they were thought to be of limited interest to a non-Russian reader. I just say that because that just makes me want to know what was left out and I don't know. Chapter 1. Looking back on it all. This chapter details how, based on the letters received and Solji's talk with present at the time of writing prison officials, can you guess? Things haven't really changed. When Solzhenitsyn gets some of his writings out about the truth of the camp system, people began to write him letters, former sex, journalists actually start to talk about it, and only some people are wise enough to leave their names off of the letters, and it turns out that camp officials, the workers and chiefs and guards, etc., they like to call themselves practical workers. And they let it be known what they thought about the camp prison system. They thought things were more than acceptable. For example, these submen with their shabby little souls were dealt with too leniently by the courts. I feel no pity for people whose behavior during the fatherland war was dubious. Why give a lot of food to those who do not work? Their energy remains unexpended. I say the criminal world is being treated far too gently. We, the executors, were also human. We were also capable of heroism. We did not shoot every fallen prisoner and by not doing so risked our posts. I've never before had to swallow such trash. And this is not just my opinion. Many of us feel the same. Our name is Legion. And that one is really interesting because Legion is a, what a demonic spirits call themselves in the Bible, which Solzhenitsyn points out, and that the person who wrote this probably didn't know what they were saying, and that they were definitely devils. That's the end of the quotes. Some people thought the book shouldn't have been published and that it was an insult to the organs the systems and workings of the Gulag Archipelago. Someone even said that history has never had need of the past. <laughs> Worst of all, although Solzhenitsyn did fall for the lie of it will never happen again, which was repeated repeatedly after his book came out, later letters came from current Zex at the time of writing, who said that the conditions weren't any better and that charges were made up against them by officials for really trivial things, and that the public still found them suspicious without knowing them if the public was told propaganda. This line in the book sticks out to me personally. There's a letter from a current at the time of writing prisoner who says they are just like the colonizers who used to pretend that Indians and Negroes were inferior human beings. Solzhenitsyn's book One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich was prized among Zex, but even when Solzhenitsyn was lauded by the administration, he even shook hands with Khrushchev himself, which I didn't know. That book, which was officially supposed to be sent to prisoners, had to be smuggled in. So the party had been lying, and one woman was arrested because she wrote about her approval of the book in the Literary Gazette. So, referring back to the title of this chapter, nothing was really looked into looking back. Chapter 2. Rulers change. The archipelago remains. The special camps, although a special brainchild of Stalin's, didn't last long after his death. And after Berea's fall, since he was a minister of internal affairs and the archipelago's boss, the MVD boss, the entire system began to fall. Prisoners started leveling charges of 
Barriaite against camp guards and they started to steal aluminum plates to make combs to comb their hair. For example, they could actually use Soviet cash, they could be a lot of visitors, their number patches were ripped off. Unfortunately, the stone jailhouse at Ekibastus where the rebellion happened, that was torn down and a lot of superfluous information like informers' notes to camp guards went missing from official records. Other things that changed were women didn't have to go login anymore, parole was allowed after two-thirds of a sentence was served, there weren't really special camps anymore, starting in 1954 until 1956. At one point, prisoners were even let out of camps to start families and to have jobs, although they were still prisoners. And prison releases started to happen. Passports were given, there were exceptions, and prisoners still had to assume guilt, just as before, but they just weren't tortured this time in order to give a confession. The country didn't apologize for its injustices against prisoners. And so Janissin says, open quote, writing out orders of release as lightheartedly and irresponsibly as though they were warrants for arrest. One woman refused to lie about her husband being a bandit, which is what she was sent to prison for, even though her husband himself admitted well, I mean, even though he didn't do it, lied and said that he had been a bandit and then he berated her for not just lying. She went back to prison for three years and some people who wouldn't confess, they were just moved to camps and there were still new prisoners being sent to camp even though releases were being made. So the system didn't actually have to change. Solzhenitsyn lambasts Nikita Khrushchev's 10-year reign because Khrushchev didn't actually use it to dismantle the archipelago when he had ample opportunity to do so. In the year of the 20th Congress in 1956, the first orders limiting relaxation of the camp regime were put into effect. And then so-called practical workers also went on the offensive when reformational laws were made. Nikita, aka Khrushchev, made decrees on discipline in the camps in 1961 while simultaneously attacking Stalin's tyranny. People in Khrushchev's camp were still there from Stalin's time, even though innocent, to keep the system going. Solzhenitsyn says that the story of the Gulag Archipelago, as he can tell it, ends around the time of Khrushchev's reign. Then the book goes on to talk about modern times and the prison system. Solzhenitsyn ends up going to talk to ministers in the present time, at the time of writing, about parcels, food, uniforms, whether the aim of prison is to actually reform people, and so on. One minister he talks to says that garden plots foster ideas of property ownership. This is after Solzhenitsyn talks about some prisoners' plants. I think it was like tomato gardens or something being just trampled down. It also seems like it's a pointless discussion to Solzhenitsyn since he isn't actually talking to them in any official capacity. There's a wide gap between what the current Zex, the people who are writing to him, were saying to him and what the officials and ministers that he was talking to were saying or would admit. And he keeps saying throughout the book that he had to go there with the assumption, whether or not he thought it was true, that the officials actually knew what they were talking about and that they had the best interests of the prisoners at heart. The ministers were saying that the prisoners didn't have a problem with what was going on, even though there was obviously a great power disparity. So Janice says that the minister simply doesn't understand that prisoners long for freedom and he thinks that the only way to resolve this misunderstanding is for the minister to be a prisoner and for a prisoner to be a minister. At the end, it's clear after Solzhenitsyn meets the director of the Institute for the Study of Origins of Criminality, someone named Igor Ivanovich Karpets, that the camps are a place for retribution. And this is a word that that director uses. And it's there not to reclaim prisoners for regular society, but to provide retribution. So Solzhenitsyn states that the archipelago was, the archipelago remains, the archipelago will stand forever. Without it, who can be made to suffer for the errors of the vanguard doctrine? For the fact that people will not grow into the shapes devised for them. Chapter 3, The Law Today. This chapter is about how the system still manifests the same errors and corruption existing in Stalin's time. Politicals still existed 
but were simply called criminals. So there's rewriting of the law. It appears different on the surface, but it's the same. There was a strike in Novocherkask by the Electric Locomotive Works in Novocherkask, the NEVZ, that started out peaceful, but boys were shot and up to 70 to 80 died from tanks. The people kept coming back to protest again and again, showing a lot of character and strength, although there were literal puddles of blood on the streets, on benches, on clothes, and there was a flag waving saying that the party and the people were one in all this bloodshed. This was from eyewitness accounts. People who weren't Russian were also brought in to shoot the residents. And Solzhenitsyn compares the handling of the situation by the administration and the lies that were told to people that things would be fixed to what happened in the Ekebastos uprising. The wounded mysteriously vanished and the families of the wounded and killed were deported to Siberia, along with many people who were a part of the demonstrations. The official story was that dum dum bullets were not used, even though they were definitely used, and dum dum bullets are those that explode, even though by any honorable code of conduct in warfare, they're not supposed to be used. This strike occurred on June 2, 1962, and is a strike that many people don't know of at the time of writing. Events like these, which is just one example, would just vanish without a trace. I found out in the research on this that a film was just made about it called Dear Comrades, in case any of you watching or listening might want to check that out. In another incident, after a man was beaten to death by police and then his body couldn't leave the precinct to go to a cemetery to be buried, a crowd burned down a police station and then the arrests were put down, classified as normal banditry. And so it was in this way that politicals seemingly stopped existing. Religious monks and believers in particular, those who refused to do military service, they could get up to five years in prisons. Religious buildings were torn down and there were mandatory re-educational classes. There was a trial of Baptists in Nikitiovka in the Donbass in January 1964. And a father's daughter was made to lie and told what to say because she was bribed and promised a place in an institute and bribed with 50 rubles in case that's important and she later tells the truth in court but just as they do in other cases they only go on the pre-trial information and then completely ignore what's said in the actual trial children were taken away from parents and particularly if parents raised their children as christians one man was let out under the two-thirds rule i think that means the parole after he was in prison for 16 years and he got married and started university and then was told that he still had nine years. So new laws were made up, which could be applied retroactively, which is something that Solzhenitsyn harps on, that Russia is the only place, his words, in the world where the law doesn't actually make any sense. He also talks about the rape clause being similar to Article 58, the one that defined politicals, because it talks about something intimate, but was written in a way to trap people. For example, some women were asked if they had consensual sex and if they said yes, they would be charged as prostitutes but if they said no, then they would have to accuse the men of raping them. And the bearing of false witness was a feature of Russian law, not a sin as it should be, according to Solzhenitsyn. Also, promises for the end of crime, which was a main promise at the time of the revolution that simply wasn't made anymore. Cases were an R at the time of writing, decided not based on merit, but based on how it would affect the official, the judge, a trustee, etc. It was all corruption. So Solzhenitsyn says, we call this chapter the law today, but it should rightly be called there is no law. That is the end of the Gulag Archipelago. Now I'm going to give my comments for this section that I just did. And then I'm going to give my overall themes and comments. In the afterword, Solzhenitsyn mentions that the book isn't perfect, which no one would expect it to be, and that he couldn't spend any more of his life on writing it. I think it's interesting that the people who were in settlements on their own and built up great wealth, they were forced to abandon everything when the state just happened to come upon them and couldn't understand why they had wealth or refused to acknowledge <laughs> why they had wealth. The term exile didn't make sense, at least after the law changed in terms of how that term was applied. 
because you were basically being treated as a slave as a person who was literally treated as a slave and because you weren't allowed to go anywhere you wanted and you had to depend on the officials for the job you might be able to have you weren't really an exile you weren't like banished speaking of which it's noteworthy that man humanity isn't allowed to go off and live where you want to live you set up station in the wild somewhere if you want it just noting how people have a desire to have power over others I mean, I get it, but just noting it. I like the part where Soldier Dixon was talking about how different groups responded differently to living in the wilderness in terms of how they would build homes or how much they would resist or education. And that reminded me of, you guessed it, Thomas Salvo, and he talks about how groups carry culture with them and do the same thing no matter where they go in the world. When Soldier Dixon was talking about the relativity of his desire changing when he was being paid 450 rubles a month and having a desk job and doing the calculating compared to when he was working in the mud pit and making clay bricks and how he thought he would be happy with that but once he was there out in uh, freedom he wanted something else and we all know that experience i also thought it funny that he still referred to himself as a prisoner and a zek even though he well i guess he was but officially he wasn't. Oh, I have to be careful how I say this, but the use of signs by the RIPO, the, the administrative division that was doing the price calculations, recalculations, saying that science, quote unquote, just like today's world, was being used to say that people don't need eight hours of sleep, as if science is not a process. I thought it was interesting how the practical workers, self-named, still wanted there to be prisons and thought that the prison conditions were acceptable because prisoners weren't at hotel resorts and needed to be punished and there needed to be retribution and how people do this to each other but it's complicated because it's some people doing it to some other people you also know once you look into it that people do this because they have unhealed issues and then they take it out on other people so just noting that also and then for this particular section volume three parts six and seven where Solzhenitsyn is talking about his conversation with a minister about the solution to prison reform and big problems like that never depending on a single individual what can i suggest breaking up the whole archipelago and letting prisoners live without guards i can't get the words out it's utopian and anyway the solution of a big problem never depends on a single individual it winds snake-like through many departments and is at home in none. So this little passage really stuck out to me because I agree, but I'm not thinking about it in terms of this context. I'm thinking about it in terms of what's going on in our world today. I think it's true that for us to solve all our problems in the world today is to focus on what we can do individually. I particularly think, and I'm about to talk about it in a second, that we each need to connect to God however you want to define that. Not that there isn't a definition, but that's just not how people work. And healing ourselves and doing what we as individuals can do because that solution is something that exists in and around us at all times. It's the great I am, I would say. And we need to connect with that in order to solve our problems today. So that's my overall comments for this particular section. Now for my overall comments and things that stood out to me on the entire book the pretense which has already stood out to me before the need for pretense to pretend to be doing good through having trials when you're really just trying to get rid of people due to pettiness or jealousy or issues inside yourself that you're taking out on other people in order to fit into society there has to be rationalization for what someone is doing which is why People who are smart, which is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, they're the worst because it's really easy, speaking from experience, to lie to oneself about why you're doing what you're doing. It's like, it's really easy and it's really hard to recognize when you're doing that. So I don't know how to say this, but of course I have to say it. While I was reading this book, literally right around the time 
I can't remember which video it will be in. When I was reading about how Solzhenitsyn discovered or rediscovered, I can't remember, God in prison, I did that. <laughs> I did that. And um, I was agnostic for 14 years, which is a really long time. And I'm hesitant to talk about it, but I know it's important to say for other people, even though it's something completely individual and nothing anyone could have ever told me could ever change my mind because that's not how it works and it also wouldn't be genuine. And uh, it's like kind of crazy and awesome and cool. And it's also comforting because the world is a dark place and it's intense. And now I understand what I didn't understand before. And I always heard people talk about this thing and it's probably the single most important event that will ever happen in my life. And though I don't know how to describe it, well, I'm starting to, if you end up following me, which I'll also talk about later after, outside of just thinking out loud, which, you know, this is ending. <laughs> um, you, will, you can hear more about that. But it was like God, who I didn't know was real. And sometimes I'm still like, ah, you're real. Like, that's crazy. God called my name. And I always hear people say that. It's like God said, Desiree, it is time. And I just, I, you can't put it into words. Um, it's really incredible. But that happened to me around the time I was reading this book. So when I was rereading my notes in order to record, because I had actually been working on videos five and six before I paused everything, and I thought I would have finished a lot sooner. I can see, I didn't actually realize that Solzhenitsyn is Christian. I didn't realize that because I was just kind of blind to it. And so he makes a lot of references throughout the book to scripture. And I was like, now I saw it before I didn't see it. So that was really interesting, like going back and relating to it in a completely different way. That's personal, but that is a big overall comment that I have on the book. I also think the importance of the number patches stands out to me when the prisoners were escaping one of the first things they would do was rip off the number patches and then also at one point when they're making demands to officials they want the number patches gone and the officials knowing how important it is to stop prisoners graves from having their names on there but they just wanted to use numbers so how important our humanity is and how these systems have to dehumanize people for us to be able to interact with each other in a way where we can turn a blind eye. Another thing was uh, the importance of religion, not just Christians, but how that had to be removed um, by the state and how they were always persecuted even when they didn't really do anything, when they wanted to teach their children, um, when they went off to do their own thing, they just, that was a threat. To the state and as we know still is in communist regimes another thing that stood out to me was how important it is for people to see each other speaking out in order to have the courage to themselves speak out it's kind of a chicken and egg thing but i would say just keep that in mind when you're thinking about what's happening in today's world i also think in a similar vein it's really important for us to be interacting with each other as humans not online but actually interacting in person with each other because you can't actually fully communicate and know where another person is at through online interaction. That's, I won't say it's not real, but it's not the full story. Another thing that stood out to me was the fact that in the world, to different degrees, we live in systems that exploit and try to control human creativity and potential. For example, with the Officers being surprised that the old believers who were out in the wilderness could make their own societies and then wanted to take it away because they couldn't do it on their own because they're stifling it under the socialist regime. Or when the Ekibastas escape happened, the rebellion, and they built a hydroelectric station. It's because people have brains and do things and were meant to create. And just to different degrees, I would say all societies they try and squash and hinder that because people want to control it. Another thing that stood out to me is the role of intellectuals in perpetuating evil and again how the mind can rationalize anything 
And this is why I've said many times throughout this Just Thinking Out Loud series that I do think that logic should be combined with the heart. I actually think that logic and reason should be in submission to the heart. But I think when people hear that, they think I mean pure emotion, which I, I do not. And society as a whole is way, way off of off of that and it is not to say that i don't think logic and reason is not in itself amazing i do i really do uh you know i've made videos on I, something i have called the decline of the attack on competency like i totally am against stuff like that but i do think that people who have intelligence need to be really careful with how they wield that because intelligence on its own that can be used to rationalize absolutely anything because that's how the mind works it's a tool and if we want something coming from somewhere else and that compass isn't set in the right direction your intelligence and reason can lead you down a path that isn't good i also thought it was interesting that there were people who were found in exile who knew way before everything happened they saw all the signs and they tried to get out of that way early. And all of them were executed early on. Another theme I want to mention is the one that was repeated throughout the book and which is really highlighted in the first uh, few parts of the book, which is that the line between good and evil is drawn in the heart of every man. And why Solzhenitsyn mentions that religion is really important because it wards against the evil that can arise from within any person rather than trying to focus on a particular group of people and saying that if we just get rid of that i would also see any system if we just get rid of that then everything will be okay no it's us each person <laughs> going along with something that's bad and not facing ourselves and denying ourselves in some cases um in order to not participate and per perpetuate evil so regular people do evil things and in order for people who are psychopaths to do what they continue to do it's because good people go along often for convenience and i really want to suggest uh, i'm like just trying to say kind of ish subtly that we as individuals work on ourselves um, we cannot force or control or even really change other people. We can influence them, but that always comes from the person themselves. I really suggest that we work on healing ourselves and also being very conscious and aware of the actions that we are taking and how that might be affecting people negatively. And when we think that there isn't another possibility or alternate way of doing something, then we won't ever find that possible possibility or alternative way of doing something so i think that all isn't lost i definitely don't think that anymore after my recent encounter with the creator of all things uh so i know it might seem difficult right now but everything is gonna be okay i know that just sounds like a platitude but it's not things don't change until we as individuals change and i know you know that a lot of you but i guess this is just a reminder and it's everybody's responsibility we all have work to do so i want to end this entire series with a quote from the preface of the english translation the fighter's spiritual strength rises to the greatest height and to a supreme degree of tension when their situation is most helpless and the state system most ruthlessly destructive so bye I'm Desiree and you have just finished watching my series on the Gulag Archipelago which is a book written by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This is Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree and uh, I hope you have a good day. I will put a little bit of an afterthought and uh, bye. So for my afterthoughts, I want to put a video here if I can find it of the first time that I mentioned that I was gonna read this book. I wanted to read it because Jordan Peterson mentioned it. And I have a screenshot of the day I actually downloaded the book, all the way in 2017, <laughs> it's 2022 now. And I realized how long it was and that it wasn't gonna be some simple thing. And then I told myself, well, I wanted to read it. And then I like, I finally did it, which is weird. <laughs>
uh, all the finishing steps of doing this felt weird like I can't believe I'm actually doing this weird when I was when I finished reading when I did like the last few recordings everything that was like the final steps was like oh I can't believe this is finally happening oh, because it just took so long it took so long <laughs> so yeah that that happened um I think the only other thing I wanted to say, I already talked about God, that's like really important, but I put that earlier. So that's there, that's like kind of crazy, and it definitely felt tied to this work, and there's just a lot of parallels, like, you know. People call them, I guess, synchronicities, but I've I had experiences before and I never really thought anything of it, but just a lot happened. Um, so I just say that. And then... Just thinking out loud is done. <laughs> it's over. I don't know if I'm gonna put like a goodbye video, like a separate one, I might do that. But if I do, I'm just gonna say what I'm gonna say here, which is I'm gonna still be around, I just won't be doing this anymore. I know it's time for it to end. I knew that when I made my announcement video. And uh, you know when things are supposed to change. And uh, I will be focusing on my art. And uh, if you follow me on uh, Desiree.com, um if you like sign up for my email i, I don't do where i can't do email campaign things i just there's just i can't do that kind of stuff so it will only be like events or what's new you can do that i'll probably occasionally post on like twitter i mean like life the way it works now like a lot is going on in society and i kind of avoid doing that stuff and i'm a lot happier for it um but I will probably occasionally post there, but I also have another YouTube channel and I'm on library. Um, that's for my art, it's called Desiree Arts and I've always had that. If you ever wanna know what I'm up to, just go to Desiree.com, it's my name, .com, D-E-S-I-R-A-E.com and you'll see my art there. And I won't tell you what, but I'm not just doing painting, although my painting is there too. And uh, you'd probably appreciate it if you haven't seen it before. So, yeah, yeah. And I know this took really long, but I can't, I don't know, huh. I can't say sorry because there was no other way for it to happen. That would have been the right thing. But I know it took a while and it's here now. So I hope it was worth the wait. I wish you all the best. I'm technically not disappearing, I'm just ending this thing. And I might do a final video. Oh, one more thing. If you want, there's still some merch. If you want to commemorate Just Thinking Out Loud, there's like, you can get a mug or a sticker or a poster. And uh, the link's in the description. And I think I, I did a video and I might put it here with like what those things look like. Thank you also. Um, for listening, you know, people were interested in what I had to say and it was good for me like The United States is not the place I grew up in and it's, it has also changed so much since I first came to this country in 2010 so This um, is good. Thank you also and also you're welcome <laughs> too. Okay. Bye